The first session of this, uh, of this workshop is going to discuss about uh, strategies to assess and address food and nutrition security in Africa and beyond. Uh, and this would be uh, handled by several prominent speakers uh, who have already introduced themselves to you all. Uh, and I think uh, food security is an important challenge for Africa in particular. In Africa, uh, I think all governments, the number one challenge, the number one engagement of all governments in Africa is how to secure uh, food. Uh, food security is an important challenge. Very often, nutrition security is not taken into the, into the perspective. Uh, very often, but nevertheless, uh, food security is, is an important challenge. And uh, I think it's an ideal time to start with Africa. You know, about food security issues in Africa. We will have a lot of discussion on, on this issue also on the third day, uh, when we have a number of uh, experts from, from different parts of Africa. Uh, so to uh, share their experience and their, their perspectives, we have four uh, prominent uh, speakers. Uh, Professor uh, Willis, he is from Kenya. Uh, he is uh, an academic at the University of Nairobi. Uh, then we have uh, uh, Andrea Dett, an old colleague of mine at the uh, University of Bosch, yeah. but now he's an important policymaker within the Indian government. Am I right? I don't know specifically where, where you are, Andrea. Uh, we have Professor Juan. Uh, Would you like to join us here? Or? <laughs> okay, you'll, you'll, you'll join us later. Uh, he's from China. From China, and uh, I'm sure you will, you will ask a lot of questions about how China is the miracle of reducing poverty significantly. Uh, that's what we would like to hear from, from China. And finally, uh, Maximo, uh, an old friend, a colleague from Italy. And I think uh, the rule of the game is very simple. This is a very tight program. Uh, each one of you will have a maximum of 15 minutes to speak on, on the issue. And then uh, at the end, we'll have about 20 minutes for your intervention from your side. Uh, my role is very simple. I, I would be a timekeeper. So uh, <laughs> first, uh, let, me, let me just call upon Willis to give uh, us his perspective. Thank you. Uh, uh, I'm going to talk about the, the subject matter treated strategies to assess and address food and nutrition security in Africa. Uh, uh, the outline is going to be as follows. One, I want to uh, uh, put the, the, the subject in context, uh, then understand the concepts we are dealing with. Uh, we also uh, would like to uh, discuss where the, uh, where the malnutrition hotspots and where are they there, the challenges, opportunities, and possible strategies. Um, Africa appears to be the only continent where agricultural productivity growth has been relatively slow, declining, poverty deaths and death is increasing, and poverty traps rampant over the last four decades. And uh, we know that achieving uh, cultural growth is fundamental to addressing the perennial food and nutrition security in the continent. Uh, the continent is characterized by diversified farming systems, agroecology, landlockedness, uh, culture, consumption patterns, and therefore it is very difficult to generalize over region. Africa is not like a single country. There is all those uh, elements of diversity. So we have to be careful when we attempt to generalize. Uh, uh, the, 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 the other characterization is that small, smallholder farms with women providing most of the labor force dominates in Africa. Uh, now we, are, uh, we have the emergence of an aging population in agriculture uh, with unemployed youth shining farming. Um, we have also uh, to consider now that the big agenda Africa agenda, is, which is spearheaded by um, comprehensive agricultural uh, 
African Agricultural Development Program is to achieve an agricultural economic growth rate, rate of 6% per annum and achieve the MDGs, which is only about two, two years away. Now, this agenda will not be, uh, will be hard to achieve <coughs> if there's no rapid agricultural um, income growth and competitiveness. Now, in terms of understanding the concepts, uh, this is probably a very familiar diagram, but sometimes it is ignored. Um, food security is multidimensional. We have the pillar of availability. Um, we also have the pillar of access uh, and then utilize, uh, use and utilization. Each of these pillars is very important and has within it several components. For example, um, in fact, we have another third pillar of stability, which is basically um, associated with uh, uh, steady supply, risk reduction, and environmental sustainability. And uh, most of the volatility and, uh, is, is, is associated with this uh, stability pillar. Now, as I was saying, um, uh, the, the, the pillar of availability is associated with issues of crop production, uh, efficient water use, uh, management of stocks, and uh, trade uh, matters. The pillar on access is associated with uh, 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 income, prices, uh, marketing, and uh, uh, trading infrastructure and, and other, other elements. Uh, the pillar with, uh, associated with utilization is a real nutritional kind of uh, uh, pillar. And it has a lot of facets, including issues rega regarding um, um, knowledge about how to, how to uh, uh, knowledge about food consumption, uh, knowledge about uh, uh, diseases, nutritional disorders, and how to balance the food. And this particular uh, nutritional pillar um, um, is important to the extent that we have we are, we are facing within our midst uh, issues of scarcity and over oversupply and uh, uh, and uh, obesity to, uh, in, in the population. So it's a very complex kind of pillar. This one of utilization of food. Sorry. Where are the malnutrition uh, mal mal hotspots? As we can see, uh, 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 the red spots are, are where the, 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 the problems lie. And as you can see, in Africa, especially uh, Sub Saharan Africa, is where the, the hotspots of, of malnutrition uh, and therefore the challenges associated with food, uh, food and nutrition security revolve around how to tackle this, or I mean, to, to address the issues in these hotspots. We find that the, the um, Africa uh, is, is bedeviled with so many problems and they are not able to meet their nutritional needs. And this is probably the subject matter of this conference and we hope we, ha we shall uh, come up with some kind of strategies eventually when food, food secure is, is over with the, with the, the with the, the various kinds of interventions to address the issues of these hotspots. And uh, the distribution of hunger is also changing. Uh, while in, for example, uh, 1990, 92, we had almost like a billion uh, 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 population in, uh, in uh, suffering from hunger, uh, this has slightly gone down to about, about um, 900, um, uh, uh, but um, the curious thing is that everyone, everyone of the continents and the regions are, have declined, uh, have, um, the population in hunger is declining except Africa. As you can see from the, 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 the yellow and, uh, numbers in sub-Saharan Africa from 1990 to 1992, the population uh, 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 which was undernourished was about 178, but this has increased in 2010-2012 to 234 million. Uh, uh, in Western Asia and North Africa, just to, for comparison, 
this has declined from 13, uh, I mean, they said from 13 million to 25 million, but the number is small. So this gives us a challenge of how to address the rising malnutrition in, uh, um, in, in Africa. And that is associated with what the slide we have just seen of the hotspots. We have to do something about um, uh, the, the, these hotspots. Why are hot, hotspots persisting and expanding? The first one is, is um, these regions continue to depend on rain-fed agriculture, despite evidence of climate change and untapped irrigation potential. Secondly, there is, uh, we, we witness weak institutions, evidenced by inconsistent, in, inconsistent stop-go kinds of policies and lack of enforcement mechanisms for legislation, <coughs> quality, standard, quality and standards including, and this leads to uh, poor incentives for those who are uh, to, uh, uh, to produce. Uh, there is also poor safety net arrangements for the vulnerable, especially women and children, persistent resource, political and religious conflicts, and inability to rethink agriculture as a value chain, linking supply and demand, and identifying and addressing these constraints along the chain. And then, lastly, is the relatively low investment on science, technology, and innovation, and people, investing in people. And uh, in Africa, uh, we have, uh, the, the resource people is in plenty, and yet there is no sufficient in investment in, in, in uh, these people. The challenges uh, associated with this is that uh, we have uh, access to, uh, access and, uh, and proper invest in land, water, and other productive resources lead to resource conflicts. Uh, the issue of linking smallholder farmers to domestic and global, global markets uh, uh, is very um, um, uh, uh, difficult, and this leads to high transaction costs in our input and output markets. Uh, we have infrastructure bottlenecks, particularly in the rural areas. Uh, we have like, uh, lack of timely data and information for action and low or lack of investment in agriculture for pro poor and equitable growth. Um, under these, we can, have, we can classify uh, the, the challenges, uh, the, the production, production related ch challenges. We have the issue of land, land tenure insecurity, unexploited irrigation opportunities, low input use, uh, in Africa, for example, we have an average use of 8 kilograms per acre in, uh, uh, as opposed to almost like 100 kilograms per acre in the more developed countries. This, uh, this is a lesson which uh, we should have, that it, in order to be able to re, um, uh, increase productivity, input use is very important, and we have to consider this in our food secure uh, um, um, uh, um, projects. Under utilization of uh, prevailing farm resources and the emerging land graph phenomenon um, uh, is also a challenge. Um, and, and sustainable natural resource management, poor physical infrastructures, which I, I just spoke, talked about, and lastly, post harvest management. Up to 40% losses are uh, witnessed in these areas, and it is very painful that after producing, using a lot of resources, you then lose it to the governance of nature. Um, there is market and institutional related challenges, and these include weak institutions to enforce contracts and other transactions, weak research and extension capacity, um, poor access to financial services, marketing and distribution system, poor and poor access to international markets. Uh, the macroeconomic challenges include high interest rates on agricultural loans and poor access to financial services, uh, tariffs on imports of agricultural inputs, and managed trade liberalization, liberalization strategies, poor implementation and support to natural resource, uh, uh, and, uh, national, regional and international trade policies, and absence of smart subsidies and other incentives on local production and value addition. Um, what are the opportunities existing? Um, uh, the, the, the opportunities we have to change the, 
the, the, the, the situation is globalization, which presents as with, uh, a, a big marketplace in which you can uh, produce and market public, private uh, um, foundation, uh, foundations existing now. Now, goodwill of development partners, remittances from citizens, and some improvements in democratization and constitutional changes, although we are witnessing a reverse, uh, reverse force. Um, possible strategies include in, uh, we should invest in rural infrastructure, uh, promote long-term level, uh, uh, farm level group-based value addition on traditional staples, uh, cassava um, and uh, all those other basic products. We should map and document quarterly, uh, quarterly or seasonal production and consumption requirements in uh, village levels. Uh, we should develop institutional mechanisms for food inventory management systems and remove artificial barriers across uh, to cross-border trade. And harnessing emerging technologies is important. Managing climate change, um, um, uh, strategic production, <coughs> timing to avoid gluts, promote direct participation of farmers uh, in markets rather than through intermediaries, manage food contamination and other foreign farms to reduce food service losses and scaling up and replication of food of good practices. The answer to the how question still remains elusive. Um, we may know um, why the problem persists and preserve solutions. Uh, and now in the various countries in Africa we have the visions. In Kenya we have the vision 2030. In Uganda we have the vision 2040. But how to implement the policies is still problematic. Uh, we need to have a buy-in by all stakeholders uh, and actors. Uh, and even how to achieve this is a problem. And this begins for a focused research and analysis, which is the charge of food secure. And we hope that uh, by the end of it, uh, the way forward might be found so that we can uh, get the, the uh, we are, we should attain the vision reflecting a full food secure and prosperous Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Willis. That was exactly the film. Uh, this is perfect. <laughs> uh, well, Willis has raised a number of issues. I think we have heard it all together. I don't want to be to pretend more smarter than you are, so I think we'll take it uh, that way and uh, keep your questions for later on. Can I invite now Mahendra to share us uh, his experience of India for And uh, I know India is also another important uh, Hans, where are you? See? Thank you. Yeah, earlier I was in the government of India, ASIPA, and now I am with uh, uh, Indira Gandhi Institute of Development Research in Mumbai. So uh, I'll be talking about uh, on India. Uh, briefly, I assess the performance and then strategies related to availability, access, and the nutrition. Uh, I also focus on uh, agriculture and uh, nutrition in the end. Uh, performance if you see uh, availability uh, for India, food grain availability is not a problem because uh, we have rice and wheat uh, uh, plenty. But there is a supply problem in pulses, oil seeds and fruits, vegetables where you need micronutrients. So here we have a uh, shortage of uh, uh, these non-cereals. Uh, then we have high food inflation and uh, price volatility. 
so we have a, at the national level food security, food grade security, not uh, the food, food security, but widespread uh, food insecurity at household level. But much more problem is uh, the malnutrition because uh, uh, still 40 to 45 percent uh, suffer from underweight and stunting. And it's almost double to the sub Saharan African levels. Uh, if you see the performance of agriculture, uh, you know, in the 80s we had uh, you know, spread of green revolution, almost 3 percent growth. Uh, later it slightly declined, particularly in this uh, period we had uh, very low growth neglect of agriculture. And, but in recent years, there is again revival of growth, almost 3.5 percent uh, growth in agriculture. Also, some dynamism in recent years, uh, because uh, as I said, growth increased in recent period. And there are revolutions. Uh, we had earlier green revolution, white revolution, the milk uh, revolution. But we have, now we have cotton, uh, BT cotton. We had uh, you know, almost the uh, production doubled in BT cotton and also success in hybrid maize and also some high value agriculture increase and some of the rainfed areas like Gujarat they have significant uh, increase in growth and also in uh, terms of trade in agriculture improved I mean I can take some credit for increasing the agriculture prices <laughs> when I was in the government uh, the, and also their exports last year almost 25, 25 4 million tons uh, rice and wheat uh, and also investment has increased in both public and private investment in 2004-05. But there are concerns because the Green, green Revolution technology has plateaued. Uh, we have uh, yield growth uh, plateaued in irrigated areas and uh, technology fatigue. And uh, GM crops, uh, you know, is not allowed in food crops. We had cotton revolution but food crops are not allowed, uh, although in, allowed in cotton. And with the changing consumption patterns, there is a demand for non-cereals like uh, pulses, fruits, vegetables. So as a result, what is happening is that the food inflation increased significantly uh, in recent years. Uh, people are calling it protein inflation uh, because in non-cereal, there is a lot of demand. And then uh, also, as I said, deceleration growth in earlier period, also decline in yield growth. And there are other challenges like uh, shrinking land base and the climate change. And still we have high subsidies for fertilizers, energy and food subsidies. Fertilizers almost $20 billion and food subsidies also, uh, I will tell more, more about that later. And also an increase in small and marginal farmers because now we have almost 85% belong to small and marginal farmers. And slow re reduction in share of employment, still we have 52% in agriculture working in uh, employment. So as a result, labor productivity between you know, agriculture and non-agriculture is increasing uh, the difference. And TFA growth also is low. Food inflation I was talking about, uh, you know, the, in 2009-10 onwards, food articles, 15% uh, uh, inflation. Although it declined, in recent again, it has come to 18%. Uh, cereals was not there earlier, but it is now also cereal spreading. Because I will tell you later why cereal inflation is high. So rice, wheat, pulses, vegetables, and uh, fruits and milk also, although now it's decli uh, declined, and eggs and meat. So they, we have an inflation problem in India. So what is the food management policy? There are three uh, things. One is procurement policy, where I was chairman of this commission. Uh, earlier. So we procure, uh, you know, minimum support prices we fix for 24 crops, but of course mostly rice and wheat. So we procure about uh, almost uh, 70 uh, million tons of uh, rice and wheat. And uh, we have buffer stocks. Uh, buffer stocks, although the norm is uh, we need to have only 32 million tons, we have 80 million tons. So almost 50 million tons of excess buffer stock in the uh, in, in the uh, in India, and we have public distribution system. I will come uh, come to that later. Basically, subsidized food. A government recently uh, said the five-pronged strategy for growth plan. Uh, first is 
because the viability of farming has to be increased, returns to investment, and disseminate appropriate technology uh, for increasing quality of research, and also use of ICTs for agriculture, and uh, also increase in plant expenditure for markets and uh, efficient use of natural resources, and governance in terms of institutions, because this is, uh, we are, as you know, more important. And also the third plan focuses on inclusiveness, because inclusiveness comes from the focus on small, small and marginal farmers, women farmers, and also government is thinking of shifting rice cultivation from Punjab to Eastern region, uh, because to encourage diversification in Punjab. Uh, and also, as earlier mentioned, post-harvest losses are also quite high. So on processing. So these are the strategies they are following now. Another thing is in India, social equity is a big thing because there are caste plays an important role. So one of the studies showed that 37% uh, and 64% differences in net income per hectare is due to the cost, uh, scheduled cost and upper cost if you see. So there is a discrimination in the market also, input and output markets. Uh, in the in the uh, you know according to the cost, so these need policy interventions because we need to uh, you know have more uh, opportunities for the other costs. And trade policies, you know, since mid 90s, agriculture liberalized, uh, reduction in tariffs, but still high for some commodities. There is a reduction. Uh, India argues in WTO for livelihood security and also what exemption for procurement and food subsidies. This is the debate now going on. Uh, exports are encouraged, but ad hoc policies. You know, sometimes uh, they ban exports. Recently, online prices increased significantly. They banned the online exports. Similarly, in 2007-8, rice, price, rice ban was there, which affected the Bangladesh. Uh, also, India is becoming a strong player in rice and wheat global markets, so it's controlling large part of world stocks. Uh, and also studies have shown food price increases in India are not co-integrated because when there was a price increase, the uh, Indian prices have not increased in 2006-8. Uh, similarly, 2010-13 also, uh, there is no relationship between uh, global prices and Indian prices. And uh, macro policies, in, in fact, some people say, like uh, T.N. Srinivas and others say, the solution for agriculture lies in non-agriculture. They say India too many workers in agriculture, so need to promote labor intensive manufacturing. So here the elephant has to follow learn from dragon uh, on this uh, on the labor intensive manufacturing because India food processing and all is very low compared to many other countries. But education and uh, skills are constraints for shifting uh, labor force. Now I come to the second part the access, the problem of access at household level. In fact, uh, if you see the poverty levels, there is a significant uh, decline in poverty in recent years. 2.2 uh, percentage points compared to the 0.74 points earlier. And access to public distribution system is another uh, kind of access, which has increased recently. From uh, earlier it was 24 percent, now 46 percent for rice and similar wheat. And similarly, other costs also have high percentage of access. So if you see the changes in poverty, uh, these are the now official numbers. 2011-12, uh, we have 22 percent poverty. So if you see annual decline percentage, earlier it was 0.74, oh sorry. Uh, and now it is 2.2 percentage points decline. Yeah. Uh, and also decline in, uh, you know, the uh, number of people and similarly access to PDS by social group access is increasing 24 to 39 45 like that and now I come to the last five minutes on the malnutrition problem because one of the paradox in India is disconnect between overall GDP uh, or agriculture growth and malnutrition we had 9% uh, growth in uh, you know GDP but malnutrition is stubborn at 45% so people are calling it Indian enigma. Uh, if you see the percent of children in uh, India compared to many other countries, uh, in, it's 43 in India, China it's 4%, uh, 
sub-Saharan Africa 20%. Similarly, of course, obesity is uh, increasing uh, in many countries. So malnutrition per capita income in India, if you see, uh, you know, all the many countries have higher, uh, same per capita income, like Vietnam and all, the malnutrition is lower. Uh, this is already shown the hot spots where the global hunger index by the IFRI, uh, here where the severity of malnutrition. Uh, India compared to others in malnutrition, so Bangladesh of course is also uh, improving but still high. Sri Lanka, you can see that, you know, India is, is the, one of the highest. And reasons for high malnutrition in India is, is that, uh, you know, less diversified diet, gender bias, high in South Asia, particular India in particular, and also some studies shows, uh, you know, younger daughters in the rural families have shorter children because of less empowerment. And also another problem is open defecation. Uh, the sanitation problem is also a good predictor of child, uh, child stunting and similarly low health facilities. Uh, India's strategies for reducing malnutrition, uh, you know, they, they have many programs, direct, direct and food nutrition programs, uh, the Maharashtra Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme, uh, Child Development Services, Midday Meal Schemes, National Food Security Bill, I will spend two, three minutes on that. Uh, this is the biggest uh, program in the world, National Food Security Bill, now it is becoming an uh, act. So they give 5 kilograms of rice, wheat, millet per month per person, and uh, for the poorest of the poor, they give 35 kilo, kilograms. So the market price is about 20 rupees, now they give at 2 rupees wheat uh, and millet rice, and they cover about 67% of the population. Uh, and also the nutrition support to children and women is also there. Uh, these are things I will skip this. But there are several issues under national, national Food Security Bill because we are providing to almost 800 million population and the subsidy is 20 billion dollars, so about 1% of GDP. So there are many issues, I don't have time to explain this, uh, maybe during discussion we can have. Because people criticize it is not improving in nutrition because they are giving rice and wheat. But there can be substitution effects, you know, uh, more money to save on this, people can buy other things. And cash versus food transfers is also another one. Uh, the impact of NFSB uh, uh, data shows that it has significant impact on poverty. You know, PDS, suppose we see, uh, recent uh, estimates show 30% reduction in poverty was attributed to public distribution system. Uh, and also we have nutrition mission in Maharashtra uh, because now many states are going for mission mode. Several states are going. Uh, it started uh, uh, 2005. So there is a significant reduction in malnutrition, 39% to 22% because of this mission. You can see the monitoring of the children, uh, the weight, weight they are monitoring. And also they have fortified chapati, I mean the bread, Indian bread. They, they have fortified one that uh, uh, giving to the children. Lastly, agriculture and nutrition. This is a, one of the emerging uh, research areas. Uh, I mean, now uh, we are doing uh, the Bill Gates Foundation project uh, is giving money to us to do the work. And there is a lot of uh, in, uh, interest in this. In India, there is a disconnect between agriculture and nutrition. The IFRI studies have shown. Uh, but what are the entry points? small farmers, rain-fed areas, backward regions. So one has to work on agriculture and nutrition pathways. Uh, IFRI study has shown that there are seven pathways, uh, agriculture and nutrition, uh, agriculture related, and the gender related are three. Of course, however, one has to be cautious about methods, correlations versus causal. Uh, in fact, this cartoon shows that, you know, correlation how sometimes can be misleading because they are asking, uh, there is no correlation between spinning cloth and the fall of the British Empire was not clear to us. And to conclude, last few two minutes, uh, the conclusion is that, uh, the, as I said, projection so rice and wheat is not a problem, but uh, we have problem in uh, pulses, oil seeds, and also to focus on long-term issues, and also to relook at price policy, because.
We are focusing too much on rice and wheat, forgetting the other crops, and natural resource management, and inclusiveness and reducing inequality, and opportunities for small farmers, because uh, uh, the small farmers uh, we have group approach and value chains and ICTs and high food insecurity at household level. The last slide, the income poverty decline, but however, we have Indian Enigma. Uh, the diet, food and nutrition programs, there is a lot of debate on India. But also remember, India is a big country with 1.2 billion population. So uh, the diversity is quite high. So some states are really doing well, like South is doing well. Uh, so need, need to focus on all the determinants in the agriculture nutrition. Fortunately, you know, under nutrition is being discussed by political parties, which was not the case earlier. So nutrition became a political issue. So hopefully it will lead to improvement of governance for better, better delivery systems, which can improve food and nutrition sector security in India. Thank you very much. Morning. Uh, I, this morning I try to talk a little different way to tell you story going on in China in the past 60 years. Let me bring you back to 30 years ago, 1950, 1960, 1970. That time China economy global slowly. Income per capita grows only 4%. Indeed, it's quite big already. But in two things happened since late 1980. Per capita income GDP goes nearly 10 percent, and per consumer, uh, 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 most income also going about 10 percent. And what happened since after this young 30 years rapid growth of the economy? Of course, in the second part of 30 years, in the first 15 years, has double full consumption and rise in the wheat as income increase. But continued growth of income has reduced. Uh, grain consumption significantly. But on the other hand, demand for high value commodity, the, the tribal, in the several type of equation, meat, uh, vegetable, fruit, uh, fish, and also all are increasing significantly. The question you will ask where this consumption comes from, from the combat of this nature. Of course, it may come from a kind of growth in China. In for 30 years, China a kind of growth only about uh, about 2%. That's just a little higher than population growth rate, 1.8%. But the second 30 years, China has a growth about nearly 5%, which about five times population growth, which is what per capita food availability increasing in China. And this increasing has multiple, only look at green sector, increasing green production. Indeed, growth comes from every sector. Oh, we have imported a lot of so it did, but it did all it said crop also grew, growing in China, vegetable, food, um, in the nice store set. Everything that has been, been growing over time. Um, and the, with genetic production growth, also consumption growth, it true that China importing a lot of soybean in uh, a lot of soybean in past, but in general, China by 2010, 98% uh, food. Are, produce, are consumer are produced in China. Only, only two percent are equal. And uh, you see the quite a global debate on China food security issue. Because China is so big, two percent is probably it's quite an important implication to global market. Okay. I think that China change is not only in any cultural sector. I say more important that it changes in the non-cultural sectors. In farmer in China in 1980s. 30 years ago, that's only about 10 percent of farmers had an off-farm job. And now, I have put data here, we finished survey a few months ago, we showed that by 2012, 
80%, more than 80% farmer have off farm, off farm job. So we increase the cultural production, increase off farm employment. In the meantime, we certainly in past 10 years, wait in China for unskilled labor. Uh, it's all farm employment also increasing rapidly. So this increasing all farm employment plus a double or triple of all farm wage increasing, the farmer income is also increasing rapidly. So this put together, indeed, the China wage now has been uh, compared to many Asian countries, it's now it's, um, one of the top uh, in the Asian uh, 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 countries. <coughs> Then I think it's not surprising uh, poverty in China rate has been declining. The most declining of in, when China started reform uh, in the 1980s, uh, 70s, it's, um, if it was one dollar to be paid, probably about 70% people under poverty. But first stage of poverty reduction is mainly due to agricultural growth. And second stage of our poverty reduction is mainly due to off farm employment increase. Yes. And people are also concerned about uh, price uh, stability issues. Uh, as here, so the international price at the border of an exporting country, the Thailand, Thai price, and this uh, May price in Chicago, for example, right? And blue one is domestic price. Right? And we see the, the global food price in, 19, in 2006, 2008, the price increasing significantly in the global market. But China price also increasing, of course. But of course, China were able to manage the uh, increase of price not as much as those occurred in the global market. Of course, there are many stories on the nineties, a whole paper to describe, determine why region policy is poised, but I don't time to talk in detail. But the main question you were going to, you were ask how China has been able to meet its growing demand for food for more than 1.3 billion population, which, uh, um, and we, we, we only have about 8% of global land, cultivated uh, land. Uh, and and uh, if this economic dynamic can continue, what will be an uh, indication to China food security at the national household level or also maybe for the rest of the world? <clears throat> so the rest of my presentation will talk about what a major driving force. Then I will uh, be, uh, provide a uh, couple of scenarios on what the prospect of China food security in the future. Then I will conclude my, my talk. <coughs> major drivers, of course, there are many major drivers. We have to, from presentation to uh, present early, there are many factors affect the economy. But I see uh, in China, for major, we have four major drivers. Uh, first, institution change. We need a big farm incentive. Yeah. <coughs> In, two, in, two in 1978, all the production under collective production. Okay. But since, since uh, 1978, the um, land are equally allocated to every household in the village. So you see, every household has own food production and food nutrition uh, uh, increases significantly. And this point is changing. Like every household has a piece of land, smaller, but they are not. Uh, Productivity increased by 50% within four years. CLP. This is for rice really major. I might study it to cover all of major commodities. Same story uh, in the Korean culture, which non tenure reform make farmer a product increasing significantly. And that reduced uh, China poverty from 70 to about 50, uh, 45%. And after uh, 1994, TLP continues to grow. And in this growth, we see that. Keep about three percent, and in my study to show what are major driving force on this growth. Concluded come about technology. Technology has been important driving force of China agricultural growth uh, from 19, uh, 70, uh, middle 1980s to uh, 1995. In my recent study, uh, the other study of since 1995, uh, we saw that continued growth about three, about roughly three percent. And uh, the most of growth is come from the top one, it's technology changes. Yeah. Yeah. The other uh, are efficient, but most are come from technology changes. You will see why cotton TLP growth, uh, technology growth is much higher than the grain sector. Uh, as you know, it, because of what BT cotton, biotech, 
I, I, I have a number of studies, so how important are BT cotton in China particularly grows? And uh, <coughs> basically, one hectare usually to need to calorie requirement can earn about, can gain a net income about 150 to 200, more than 200 US dollars. <coughs> and the same, um, in the same story, we found uh, on the uh, lower technology in livestock growth. I don't know how to keep it here now. And third is the very important I see is marketing reform. So what is China did uh, make us institutional right first. Then make the technology available to farmers. When you produce more, then you need a marketing for farmers to give up. So the sequence of reform, sequence of investment. <laughs> and then reform, and before in 1980s, early 1990s, the China market that's separated. That's about, not really about half of market are integrated. But with the market reform, state get out of the marketing system. And, and uh, by early on the century, nearly 100% of the market in China are fully integrated. And this market reform uh, uh, not only occurred within domestic market, it did also occur at the border of China uh, market. I see it's a nominal protection rate. Uh, 20 years ago, China protect, nominal protection either 40 to 50, 80 percent or net, 50 to 20 to 60 percent. But by, by, by the time China joined W in 2001, most of commodities in China price are across, across to the world market. market. So this uh, reform, uh, mar domestic market reform, domestic uh, border reform, had, had helped China account to moving from Green based economy here to more diversified livestock fishery economy. Farmers gain from the high only commodity production. And, and, um, and it, not only farmers are shifting from crop sector to livestock fishery sector, which have much more profitable commodity. Even within the crop sector, the bottom one, and the farmer also shifting from green sector in 1980, 80% of area located to green production. And now it's, not, it's uh, about uh, 65, and uh, um, I believe this trend will continue going down. And the cost for all, how the cost for the sector and increasing in which, uh, over time, which uh, become uh, a high value commodity, high profitable for farmer uh, production. Last but not least, it's investment. Of course, uh, investment not uh, I mean uh, it's after the market reform start investment. Investment should be very, very beginning. China started investment in for the engaged land in, in 1950, that's 60 years ago. I think irrigation in China is quite similar to African Lao problem. Only a few areas are irrigated. But over time, um, irrigation is expanding rapidly. And then if you want, uh, now, roughly about 50% of area in China have been irrigated. And this has continued to, run, to increase over time. Investment not only irrigation sector, indeed uh, public investment may cover all rural development issues. Here, so uh, every three, four, every, about every four years, but government budget uh, spend in a cultural sector double in real terms. Real term. <laughs> of course, uh, before 2004, a cultural in China was taxed by government by 5 to 8%. But since 2004, government changed policy from taxing a cultural to subsidize Akato. And by last year, uh, Akato subsidized the total amount about 3% of it, more than 3% of the GDP. <coughs> but good thing here is, this, most of these subsidies, uh, like a grain subsidy, seed subsidy, uh, input subsidy, these are decoupled, so they don't have deposit to the market. Yeah. Come on. And machinery is coupled based on how, what kind of machine you buy, they give you one third of subsidy. But the goal of government try to use uh, this subject to increase the farmer income so that uh, farmer income in rural area it will grow it will be similar as urban uh, consumer, even higher in urban areas. Uh, next, I'm going to talk a uh, couple of minutes on what the prospect of food security and trade in the future. And, uh, um, in the next 10 years, government uh, the target is trying to further double our China economy. Per capita income probably grows about seven uh, percent. And so far, for three years, now it grows by in the last three years, it's roughly about eight, a little more eight percent growth rate. Okay. <clears throat> if this is going to happen, what is going to implications of food demand, supply, trade? 
I don't have time to go to a lot of demand and issues, but I want to mention two issues. China also facing great challenges, water uh, in the, uh, challenges, in also uh, in technology issues. Why water is a uh, challenge? Because China uh, water only one eighth of our energy, and that's why China has been investing a lot in water in past uh, three decades. And uh, two years ago, uh, when government uh, revisited water sector from the investment, still not enough. So decide in the last nine years, from 2012 to 2020, to double investment in, in water sector, roughly about more than 60, uh, 100 million uh, billion US dollars. Technology also changed because China uh, is uh, quite high, TFP quite high already. So the further to increase a kind of technology, productivity, and also two years ago, I also engaged this uh, review of the policy. Well, in the concluding column, sixty percent of investment growth rate is not enough. And, uh, proposing last year try to increase the uh, uh, lower growth rate, growth rate and cut to R&D to more than sixty percent, or sixty percent become minimal investment growth rate. That's in usual term. <coughs> so what might likely in the future? This is based on my early project and to show. Despite China's great effort to put investment in agricultural sector, rice wheat going to serve sufficiently, but the main import probably going to increase over time. In time. Of course, there are some other solutions. I also put another scenario to see, and this year we project by 2025, why China going to import about 25 million metric ton of maize. That's about the 10 percent of China maize consumption in China. And then I also put scenario to see. Uh, is any technology, any investment help China reduce major import, increase domestic production? Uh, one technology is that simple made, which is available already in China by having commercialized, which can help China to increase five per, nearly 5% of main production in China and reduce about 4% of uh, 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 service, increasing 4% of service efficiency. But again, this is just one technology. It increase irrigation and those technology increase, I believe, China were able to include more maize production in China. Of course, besides maize, China also imports another uh, huge amount of soybean. This is soybean imported by 2010, and my projection to 2025 import of soybean continue to increase. On the other hand, China also is exporting fruit for the cultural sector. Uh, major import in future probably maize, soybean, Daily product in the in cotton and some little more uh, sugar yeah, we import. But overall, here probably uh, keep more than 90% of China uh, full service sufficient. I think this is quite high for, uh, for the country with uh, uh, high uh, population and uh, with scarce non water resource. Let me conclude my presentation. <coughs> I think I, the point I want to make here uh, China's experience so that. Incentive to farmers, uh, technology, and investment are crucial to agricultural growth, which has also played critical role in national uh, household food security. However, given its resource constraint in land and water, per capita, and rising demand, China is expected to increase its dependence, dependence on oil, agricultural commodities, particularly maize, soybean, cotton, and dairy products. Uh, and given the challenge, uh, China, I, I also believe, will continue to heavily invest technology and the rural infrastructure to ensure its uh, food security. Today, I'm here, I think uh, uh, there's a great opportunity for China and Africa to work in together. Uh, 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 why this, I think, uh, uh, indeed, China and Africa corporate have been benefiting each other already in past 10 years. Growth in trade and cultural trade has grown about 20 or uh, 21 percent roughly, and China export growth to Africa mainly for fruit sector, um, apple, no fruit sector, and processed food, uh, uh, 90 percent. African export to China is about 24 percent. But that's a high, very high potential, have, which have heavily realized. And I think uh, there's a, a cotton. Uh, this is uh, African export to China. It's here's a cotton, uh, uh, sesame, uh, 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 edible, mainly sesame, and other commodities. I think if there's increasing irrigation, uh, it's part of the agriculture in African sector. So we not only use China market, Chinese market, also use Chinese investment. I think there are high potential to increase 
uh, full production in everything. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was, I think, fascinating. Yeah. Was and I think, uh, you know, whenever I, I, I attend you know, presentations about China, it's always fascinating. So thank you, Professor. Uh, the next one is by uh, Maximo Torero. Uh, I know he's an internationalist, but I don't know whether he's going to speak about South America mm -hmm. uh, for today. Uh, but, uh, Maximo, you have the ten minutes. Sure. Thank you. Okay, so thank you so much. What I'm going to do is try to present uh, how South America and, in general, the whole region of Latin America is behaving in terms of food security and especially in terms of food supply to, to the world. Uh, my presentation will be based on some comments. I will have three comments about South America uh, where I will try to bring the major issues which I think are important to, to take into, into consideration when talking about what is happening. First, uh, one thing which is pretty important and has been now evident is the role that Latin America can play uh, as a global supplier. And specifically, some countries of South America, which are Paraguay, Uruguay, Brazil, of course, Argentina, uh, uh, which has been key exporters. And this has been evident uh, last year with what happened in the US with the drug and how Brazil, for example, and Paraguay and Uruguay immediately responded in terms of a supply response to the drought uh, in terms of soybeans and, and, and what was happening in corn. Now, if we look at how is the evolution of the food surpluses and deficits in selected regions, uh, we will see here that in the case of South America, there has been a significant increase uh, in the latest years since what happened in 1965. Uh, and, and clearly, as it's shown in the, in the graph, the last years have been a substantial increase, which is mainly driven, driven by the countries I mentioned before, compared to what has been happening in other regions uh, of the world. So that is offering a huge potential uh, for the region and has shown to be able to change uh, the capacity to, to increase uh, the surpluses uh, to export to the world uh, since 1965 to today. What I'm showing here is the total agricultural per capita growth in selected regions between 1960s and 2000s. And again, in red, you have Latin America compared to the world, for example. Uh, the growth rates, especially in the last decade, has increased significantly even compared to the US and Canada and the European Union. So I mean, it's showing that in total agriculture per capita, there's a significant increase uh, in the region of what is happening. The same when we look at the total food per capita growth, uh, again, we find since 1990s an increase of a growth rate of 1.7 and the 2000s of, of 1.8, relative to what we can see in the main other exporting, exporting countries in the world. Now, when we try to, to look at, at convert all this into a standard measure through calories, uh, work of David Labor and, and colleagues, what we see that in terms of the imports of calories, the growth uh, of the region has been 3.5 times, times of what was uh, initially in 1981. And when we look at the same measure in terms of exports, the increase has been 7.5 times, which shows that the region again is becoming a significant potential in terms of potential supply of calories uh, to the world. So, in the, what I am trying to, to show is how, how this has been evolving. Again, if we look at, as a, at the sharing total imports by region, we will see again that in, in calories, fats, and proteins, uh, Latin America has shown a significant growth the last two lines of the table uh, in all of these components uh, of, of food uh, across uh, the region, showing again the significant potential that it has. Now, in terms of trade, net food trade, again, uh, we see that especially uh, Latin America as a whole, but when, when we look and we exclude uh, Argentina, Brazil, and Mexico in this case, uh, we see that the inequality within the region and how important Argentina, Brazil, and Mexico is in terms of exports and lately uh, Paraguay and Uruguay uh, has become. So again, despite there are four or five countries which are growing substantially, there is significant inequality between the region which is important, is something important to note and which I will go in detail across my, my second comment. The second comment that I want, to, I want to bring, that despite what we have seen in Argentina, Brazil, Paraguay, Uruguay, uh, the productivity uh, and research and development and innovation and technology transfer in the region uh, still is not at the level it could be. So when we look at the ratio uh, of agricultural productivity 
uh, in the U.S. versus Latin America. Uh, so what we are seeing is that still the U.S. is ahead of Latin America. And that is because of the variance that we have between the countries of Latin America. But when we start looking at the specific countries uh, in the region, uh, and especially looking at research and development expenditures as a whole in the region, we see again that the research and development has been declining uh, since the beginning periods of 1970s in the region, and that's a, a problem, which is capturing uh, this inequality within the region. But in the specific countries, uh, and we look at each of the countries here, the graph is showing the blue line is the ratio of cultivated to total suitable land, and the red is the percentage of potential yield achieved. And what this is trying to bring is the heterogeneity that we have across the region. So, for example, if we look at Uruguay, the potential data shift is huge, and that has been empowered the last years. Paraguay, again, we have a significant improvement. But when we look at countries like El Salvador, uh, Haiti, Cuba, Guatemala, for example, where we have huge problems of hotspots of malnutrition in the West area, the same in the case of Honduras. Look at that, uh, that gap in the case of Honduras, which is significant problems. Like it to what we are observing in Brazil and Argentina, Paraguay, Uruguay, uh, which are the key exporting countries of cereal soybeans. Other countries, uh, especially Chile, Peru, uh, and Colombia, are more focusing on, on high value commodities like to soybeans or maize uh, and wheat. But again, the important message of this graph is to show the potential because of the space that we have with respect to the cultivated land, but also the differences and, and the heterogeneity in terms of the potential yield, yield the shift, which is the result of, of the first graph I show relative to the U.S., how we're doing in terms of productivity. Now, in some of the countries, uh, and here I'm showing Argentina, uh, which are the, the key big countries uh, in terms of exports of food, uh, there has been a quick adoption uh, of, of soil conservation technologies, uh, and this is the evolution of the non-till planting. So the, the increase has been significant. Similarly, if we look at Brazil, uh, again, we see that significant uh, rate of adoption, which is, of course, what is resulting in significant increases. This is the, the adoption of, of, the, of the RR soybeans in Argentina during the period of 1986 and 2002. And again, for, for soybeans, for wheat, and for corn, you see the significant jump in terms of, of adoption rate. Again, showing the heterogeneity and how some of the key countries are being the key ones uh, increasing the technology adoption. This is the evolution of the area planted uh, with GMOs in the case of Brazil. And you will see again how significant it is the increase of the soybean GMO planting. Uh, corn, uh, cotton is not important uh, initially. And then you have uh, other, other uh, changes in, in, in the bottom graph in terms of GMO adoption. Now, one important issue, uh, and which is typical of these countries, of Argentina, Brazil, Paraguay, uh, and Uruguay, is the land structure. Uh, that's pretty important. And, and the message I want to bring is, if I look at the countries in Central America, which are the most food insecure in the region, and the Caribbean, uh, and especially in some Asian countries, I will see a huge amount of atomization of lands. But in these key exporting countries, the situation is very different. Here I am showing uh, the number and average size of farms in the National Agricultural Census for Argentina, in from 1952 to 2008. And the average size of the farms in total acres is huge, as you can see there. It's enormous. Uh, the same if I look at uh, the case of Brazil. Between 1920 and 2006, uh, look at evolution. Uh, and if we look at the distribution within use and index, a Gini index, again, we see that, that, that the, the inequality of the distribution has increased to such. So again, when we talk of small farmers in these countries, we're talking of huge areas relative to what we talk in Asia and Africa, where normally we're looking of plots of less than an hectare, for example. Here, the situation is completely different, and it's allowing for this uh, high-scale production and huge capacity of, of supply response, which is something to, to look at it carefully. This is the case of Paraguay, a, a country which a significant part of the GDP depends on soybeans, for example. It's very vulnerable to soybeans, uh, what happened in the soybean market. Uh, and again, less than five hectares, uh, uh, Average size too, but if you look at the, at the distribution between 5 to 10, 10 to 20, and so on, and even now with the new government, there is an intention to increase the concentration of land in Paraguay to be able to increase uh, the productivity. This is something that is being proposed, it's still not yet implemented. But look at the average size of the bigger group, it's 10,719. If I look also, for example, at what is happening in Peru, which is exporting mostly high value commodities lately. Again, you have a significant reconcentration of the land, especially in the coast, 
where most of the productive land is. And even in the Sierra, we are starting to concentrate land through group uh, horizontal coordination and farmer association. So the, the structure of, of the ownership and the property rights, which is very important in the case of Latin America, there has been significant uh, institutional reforms uh, in, in property rights. Uh, the, one of the first uh, reforms came in Chile, which came at the same time as the land titling reform in the case of Peru, what we call the agrarian reforms. But uh, Chile moved significantly faster than Peru. Peru was estimated until the last two decades where Peru started to react. But Chile has uh, increased significantly uh, the farm size as a result of the land reform. This is the case of Uruguay, uh, again, similar to the previous cases. The average size of the farm, 288 in 1990s and 361 in 2011. And the certifications of farms by size, again, you will see that most of the concentration is between 20 or more hectares, which again give these huge economies of scale for, for agricultural production. Another comment which is pretty important in the region is the concept of infrastructure, and that's where still we are facing some, some problems. Part of the supply potential response that the countries have in the last years because of the crisis that has happened, if we want to call them crisis, uh, uh, was that they didn't have the capacity, for example, the pork capacity or the raw capacity to be able to respond quickly to be able to export. And that created a problem. I, I was told, for example, in Brazil, you could find the huge lanes of trucks trying to deliver to the ports. So the, the network was not ready to, to respond so quickly. So there is a significant need uh, to improve that, and especially to start to bring the regional concept of infrastructure on how to link the different, the different ports. And that's something that governments are trying to push forward, but it's still uh, there's a significant gap on that. The situation is even worse in the most food insecure countries, especially in Central America and so on, where, where this is still is, is, there is a significant infrastructure gap. But the concept of infrastructure, I think, applies across the different regions. But in the case of, of South America, it's something still that needs a lot of work to be able to reduce those gaps, not only to improve the road network, but also to improve the whole value chain of transportation up to the ports to be able to move the commodities at the velocity you need to move them. So I don't want to, to bore you with, with data on that, but that's a significant component that needs to be done, and, and there is investment that needs to be done there. The other concept which is starting to move uh, pretty strong is what we call regional integration. Uh, and there is, of course, the idea to absorb, to absorb uh, achieve food security and the regional strategy. If you have countries that have such a surpluses and you have countries that have deficits, like Central America, it's pretty easy to move commodities from one location to the other if you have the appropriate mechanism to do that. But also the regional integration is becoming to play a significant role. Uh, you have the Mercosur, you have Mexico, Chile, and Colombia, and Peru, which now are starting to do a kind of a free trade zone agreement, which will allow commodities to move across them. But also within uh, the Mercosur, Argentina, Paraguay, uh, Uruguay, and Brazil are starting to coordinate activities. They even have developed a new, a new document of, of how they can become the potential uh, suppliers of agriculture uh, in the future. So, so regional integration and, and reducing distortions to the market I seems to be the way uh, the region is moving and the way uh, they are trying to move and, and the supply of these commodities across the region. My third set of comments is about uncertainties that these countries could, are facing. Uh, the first one is in terms of extreme events. Uh, and here we identify still a gap of institutional design like insurance mechanisms, massive insurance mechanisms. There are some experiences like in Mexico that have uh, developed uh, weather indexes systems with the support of the government, but it's still uh, I think the level and the increase of the number of extreme events uh, is still growing. And clearly uh, in the Americas uh, we have a problem of, of earthquakes, uh, uh, the, the second column, uh, uh, which uh, we need to find and also draw so that we need to find ways to to, to resolve them and try to find mechanisms and institutional institutions behind. And that's something where, where the region has to move uh, and improve. The other element is the climate change uh, and potential impacts. Uh, there are regions that already are reacting. For example, in the case of coffee, Colombia is supposed to be affected substantially, the coffee growing area. Uh, and they are already doing plans to be able to change. Although the problem there, um, and, and where we have concerns, is what will be the effects uh, because of under the different climate change scenarios? Oh, and these are simulations that were done with, with Mirage. Uh, and the, the changes vary significantly across the different, the columns are the different scenarios of climate change. And as you will see, it moves up and down. So, so that, we don't have a clear picture of what will happen. So responding to this is, is kind of complex. What we know is that the variability will increase. 
but that's something to, to look more carefully, and that's something as a region needs to look more carefully. Look at Brazil, for example, how, how the different scenarios will show different results, and the same in the case of, of Argentina. Uh, the same when we look at the evolution of imports and alternative climate change scenarios, we see a significant level of variability depending on the scenario you are looking at. So these are issues that we need to look at carefully uh, and how we can cope with not too much of a knowledge of what is really going to happen uh, is something that is a question mark and something that the country and the regions needs to focus a lot. Uh, here is the case of, of uh, imports and alternative scenarios uh, and this is basically a summary of, of what we have happen in terms of with no trade policy and trade liberalization under the different climate change scenarios. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Simo. Uh, may I invite uh, the speakers to come over here? We don't have much time, but uh, but uh, I think having heard the perspectives from Africa, South America, China, and India, I'm sure you have a lot of questions. Uh, we may not have time to entertain all the questions, but uh, I will uh, I will take about four questions, at least one for each of the presenters. Aleko, sir, Joachim. Am I for? I have a loud voice, but if you yeah, I know you, you, you can speak. speak. Oh. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I was actually fascinated by all four presentations, um, uh, and, and they focused, of course, on different aspects. Was only Maximo Lau that really presented the international or the risks of these changes. And that's what I want to focus on. Uh, on Africa, the situation is pretty clear. Africa is a net importing region and it's becoming more so. Uh, Asia also is a net importing region, it's becoming more so, while Latin America is a net exporting region, it's becoming more so. China is the big enigma. You, you presented the situation that China is roughly self-sufficient but if you look at the structure of production within China, which is very micro-based, very small farms for the most part, and if you look at the fact that China is growing, it's at the, at the frontier of its production, and hence the only way for those people to increase incomes is either to go partly to non-agriculture or to move out of agriculture. That suggests that China in the future would not only become more net import dependent, but has also the potential, like the US and Russia in the old times, to become a sudden uh, sort of crisis uh, uh, in, in, in producer. Uh, let's say if there is a sudden demand, a big demand for China, that would certainly affect the world markets. And um, so I just wanted to ask the perspective of the speakers as far as their views on future uh, potential crises or future potential risks. And Maximo, you already alluded to that, but I would like to get the perspective of uh, others. Thank you. These were great presentations, uh, um, and um, uh, let me push the panel a bit on the following point. When you take a, um, a review check on which of 
the three major pillars related to food and nutrition security are the most researched and the least researched. The availability is the most researched. The access follows. Um, the uh, nutritional value aspects, which relates to people's well-being, is the least researched. Uh, Mahendra, you focused a bit on that. Uh, Maximo, you left that out. Uh, uh, Kikon, your institute is doing great research on the nutrition side of China's agriculture and rural change. Maybe you could talk a bit about that. Uh, and and Willis, uh, you highlighted the hotspot aspects in their complexities, including nutrition aspects. My observation is, I think, uh, the Food Secure Project, which wants to focus on food and nutrition security, needs to push itself further to the uh, to the end of the value chain related to nutrition outcomes, people's well-being, etc. Uh, and has a challenge to connect to uh, the access and availability. Uh, I think that's, uh, that's a big challenge which we should address. Any one last? Um, thank you very much. Um, with the exciting presentations that I, I have witnessed, I can only have Questions and not comments. Uh, my question is to Professor Mahindra. Uh, you talked about the fact that uh, India didn't experience um, increase in prices during 2008 and 2011. And I wanted to find out um, to what extent um, the holding of stocks, holding of reserves, um, play in hedging the price of volatilities. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I, I wish we had more time for more interventions, but I think uh, let's give the, the speakers to reflect on some of the issues. Shall I start with Joaquin? Okay. Okay, so let me first uh, go to Joaquin's question. And I, I, leave it, I left it in purpose because Latin America has history in terms of, of social net programs, safety net programs, and, and nutrition programs. Uh, although uh, the problem I see, uh, I don't think it's less research. I think that agriculture and nutrition was not linked together, which is basically what we're trying to, to do now uh, with this linkage of agriculture, health, and nutrition. Now, the changes that have happened are tremendous. In Brazil, for example, the transformation that has happened uh, in the poorest areas, and also in, in several Asian countries, have been significant. Uh, but the major problem, uh, at least in the in the food insecure or, or the countries which are more importers, mostly in, in Central America, is how you target these hotspots of malnutrition. Yeah? How effective you can be in, in targeting properly the investment in those areas so that you really use your dollar efficiently to reduce uh, malnutrition. And, and again, if I look at the programs in Guatemala, for example, I look at the programs in Honduras, the Feed the Future programs, which are trying to bring this agricultural nutrition if I have to be honest, they are still not linked. Uh, and most of the programs are specifically nutrition programs that don't need to production agriculture. Uh, so, so I think still there is a gap. Uh, and that's something that we need to learn how to create that, that, that linkage in, in a proper way. But I think it could be that uh, although they are related, policies could be different because most of the areas that have the worst situation of nutrition are not proper agroecological zones for agricultural development. Case of Guatemala, case of Honduras. So something to, to look carefully. In terms of the of, of the of the risk, I, I try to bring some of the risks, and, and and of course there are some institutional responses to those. Yeah? But clearly, what you were saying is exactly what I was commenting to David in the plane when we were flying tonight. When I was in the AMIS meeting last week, uh, and they put the share of, of the imports, okay, total imports. China was there. Most of the pie chart was China. So if something happens to China, then we will have a problem in the world. And that's clear. Uh, and I don't see, after I hear your presentation, that that will change. On the contrary, they are focusing more on high-value commodities. Uh, so I think that dependency is still there. And there has not been any structural change 
with the exception of what happened uh, in, in some Latin American countries, that, that I, should, I see the, the structure of the market to be more, more diversified. Okay? The market is structure of imports and exports. It's still, it's a significant uh, concept of the structure, especially in the export side, but in the import side, it's even worse. So, so how to do that and, and what can be done to, to minimize that potential risk is something pretty important that, that we need to look at. And for me, it's still one of the major risks in the future if we will have another of these uh, problems of, of excessive volatility or, 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 or price uh, uh, spikes. Uh, David, in terms of, of, of across, clearly to me, uh, the issue of uh, land structure is important. That's why I brought these tables. You have to see, look, we're getting significant improvements in this region, but the land structure is different. That is tied to property rights. Uh, if, of course, we want to be in foreign direct investment to, to Africa or to, or to Asia, you need to have clear property rights, and that's a problem. And the second issue is infrastructure and access to technology. Uh, and, and the whole uh, things behind this, you see the adoption of TMOs and so on and so forth in many of these countries which are growing so much. So, those things are pretty important and not, are not solutions that can be done in the short term. One clear example in Latin America was the problem of, of the coffee rut that happened last year in Central America, where they tried to resolve it, but it was close to impossible. The major solution was replanting. But why was it impossible to do other type of technological assistance and so on? Because in, when, where it happened, which was Central America, there is a lot of atomization of land. People use very low quality technologies. So to be able to, in the short term, to transfer that technology fast was impossible. So, so again, it's something to, 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 to think uh, uh, very careful uh, on that. Uh, I think I agree with uh, Kim Wan Brown on this. Uh, in the focus of uh, food security project also, I think more on uh, the nutrition aspect also, they have to cover much more than the present. Uh, and, uh, in mean, some of the presentations also, I feel that more concentrate on availability uh, compared to access and nutrition. Because uh, nutrition is the most uh, important, the well-being of the children as well as women and others. Uh, so for that, uh, I think the research, uh, uh, you know, particularly I mentioned the agriculture nutrition is becoming an important uh, issue. Because a lot of work has been done on health and nutrition, but agriculture nutrition uh, is one area where uh, one has to concentrate. On uh, uh, the, the stocks, uh, I mean, uh, prices in, in India, during 2007 uh, you know, the rice and wheat prices were almost 100% decrease, 80 to 100% decrease in global market. But in India, it's only 10% increase. So basically, the, as you mentioned, the stocks were responsible, and also India banned exports of uh, rice and wheat. Uh, so that also helped, but whether it's the rice, right policy or not, uh, one has to see. But in 2010 to 13, independent of the world markets, uh, Indian prices have increased. The particularly non serious fruits, vegetables, and uh, others have increased significantly. And also recently rice and wheat, because uh, government is the biggest holder. Uh, in the sense, 80 billion stocks are the government. As a result, availability in the open market is not there. So that's why serial prices have uh, increased. So, and the, lastly, on the uh, David Gilbert man's uh, comment, I think as mentioned by Maximo, uh, infrastructure and technology, uh, I feel like more cross-cutting. Infrastructure includes water, also mentioned in Chinese uh, presentation. And, uh, and the other one is the markets, because uh, you know, with food inflation high, the how much farmers are getting is important. Uh, I give the example of tomato. Uh, some of the Indian farmers get one rupee, whereas in the market it's forty rupees. So there is a difference between one rupee and forty rupees, particularly in fruits and vegetables. So the markets are important. So lastly, on the future potential of world markets, uh, I mean, from the Indian point of view, you know, the rice and wheat. Uh, we have self-sufficient, uh, but other crops we depend on uh, pulses, uh, all seeds. But the problem is when the India enters market, the global prices uh, increases. For example, in pulses, when we enter, the prices uh, increase. So uh, the 
I said we, uh, we don't have that much problem, but uh, China, if it enters, what happens to the global markets, one has to see. Okay, uh, let me first address risk uh, issues. Uh, here is also Chinese government concerned about the change on um, food uh, consumption of the internal market. But indeed, the only, only commodity China could uh, significantly more market is soybean. May depend on uh, the government technology because May here in China now only about uh, it's only about half of US, uh, more than half of US. So then the first soybean one, uh, uh, China now only produce 10% of 15% of soybean for domestic consumption, 85% are imported. From abroad, I, I, I and so the leader of one also consider. But on one hand, we also consider risk of the rest of world can supply eighty five percent short into China. Okay, I think that this is the area uh, of also inter 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 international market and Chinese own also think about risk because if soybean price changing, it's going to be huge impact on that uh, nice for meat sector. Uh, we import soybean maybe for for food, protein feed. Uh, this is an issue we need to uh, understand. And uh, second, uh, David question I asked about uh, priority issue across the country. I think we should divide two things. One is policies, which doesn't require much money. That institution get incentive, institution right, property right. But that is need political commitment to do that. Uh, uh, a second policy is smart thing. You know, government to a liberal market. But in terms of investment, surprising investment, I think the infrastructure is, is mostly important. The infrastructure so start with engagement first. Uh, the second, they need to go to a road uh, contraction. In 1980, 1990, China put a huge amount of road contraction. If there's money, it's worth paying money uh, uh, to invest in road. If you look at China now, a kind of commodity, Transportation of 1,000 kilometer. The cost of transportation of 1,000 kilometer distance, that's only about 3 to 4% of price. price. I look at everything. You move 1,000 1, kilometer commodity, the cost of transportation is more than your original price, double. And this is very important because the income get a price similar to retail price. The price. A income income immediately increase. This increase in income from uh, infrastructure improvement is much more than increasing income from technology. Right. I think this is a very important invest irrigation in public productivity, but then you need the infrastructure to make productivity commodity move out. The input can move in. You get cheaper to input from outside. You get higher supply from the market set by certain product. Last one about, um, about, uh, question about uh, nutrition. I agree that. I think uh, uh, my sister also put uh, another about nutrition uh, issue. Nutrition security is more serious than, than the uh, food, uh, house of food security. Scott and I we just write a paper we call it second uh, food security. And they wish to show that nutrition security still is much, much higher than household, uh, uh, household food security for a number of reasons. Because even your income increasing, you don't know how, how to treat children. And then we do survey in poor areas in China, ask the mother, how after you give a birth, when you need to give additional meat for your kid. And most kids are after one year, first you have to give meat, they eat uh, rice, um, so those kind of education, I think it's not the only income, productivity, acceptable, I think education, training, knowledge, and that is very important for, for nutrition security. Well, in the last uh, comment, I think I agree with uh, what has been said, only to deliver the point that in, with respect to Africa, Africa actually potentially would be the net exporter. Uh, the institutional challenges and other um, related uh, challenges are uh, 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 sorted out. Um, um, well, the, the 
common threads that we talked about in, in Africa, particularly, uh, with respect to nutrition. I think the emphasis needs to be uh, placed on uh, ed nutrition education, especially bioeducation, uh, bio or reproduction of food, so that issues like vitamin A deficiencies and all those uh, nutritional disorders can be, can be addressed. The issue of knowledge management, uh, with respect to sharing best practices, I think is important because that is from where we can benefit from uh, um, experiences of those who have passed through the uh, challenges. Um, the issue of food waste, I uh, think, is a big thing, um, especially uh, uh, if the food waste can be minimized. I think uh, food can be made available for those who need it, uh, as it were. Otherwise, again, the issue of regional integration in Africa, being a diversified kind of continent, I mean, there are so many, I mean, we can benefit from this diversity, but if only we open the borders so that there can be regional trade, rather than closing the borders and therefore suffering so much, uh, even if the neighbor is so, uh, at supplies food, you cannot have um, that supplies transported to the neighboring country. So regional integration, it's important in this, in this respect. Thank you very much. Well, uh, in my opinion, that has been a very good uh, approach, setting the seat for the discussion that follows. Uh, having you know, seen the experience of uh, China, India, Latin America, and the context and the issue in Africa, I think uh, this is a very good uh, you know, framework for, for our discussion over the next two and a half days. I, uh, I don't want to take uh, more of your time. Uh, please join me in thanking the board. <laughs> Hans, I know I have taken much of your time. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. I think after this um, splendid panel, I think.